Go watch part one if you haven't already. Introduction to analysis. Le big integral. In normal integration, the integral is defined by splitting the curve into extremely thin rectangles and adding the area of all those rectangles. This is called Riemann integration, but not everything is Riemann integrable. Take, for example, the function f of x, which is zero when x is rational and one when x is irrational. Now, there are infinitely many values where x is irrational, so the y equals zero line should be filled in. And there are also infinitely many values where where x is irrational, so y equals 1 should also be filled in. So what is the integral from 0 to 1? Is it a, 0, b, 1 half, c, undefined, or d, 6, 7? Ha 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 6, 7, he said the number, he said the funny number. Ha 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 ha. Now, if you answered option A, then good guess, but you're wrong. If you answered option B, then that's a better guess, but you're still wrong. And if you answered option C, you're still wrong. And if you said option D, then just get out, okay? Just leave. You're not even funny, all right? And you're probably like 10 years old. What, six, seven, who cares, okay? The answer was option E, which was one. This is because the set of rationals is countable, which means it's also le big measurable with measure zero. Using the Cavalieri formula, you can substitute the integral of f as just the Lebesgue integral of the Lebesgue measure from 0 to 1 and you get 1. This is basically saying that if you pick a random number on the real number line then the chance of picking a rational number is essentially 0 because there are infinitely many more irrational numbers than there are rational numbers even though there are infinitely many rational numbers it's just infinitely many more than infinite. Therefore you can just assume that f of x is just 1 for all real numbers x because it kind of is even though it also isn't. And then integrate that and boom you've just done Lebesgue integration. Vitelli sets. Giuseppe Vitelli invented a set that has no sides. To find the numbers in this set, first take the real number line from 0 to 1 and put all the rational numbers in a box and then put all the irrational numbers in another bigger box. Then take all the irrational numbers and find the difference between pairs of irrational numbers. And if that difference is irrational, then simply move one of the numbers into a new box. But then if you have, for example, pi over 4 and pi over 4 plus 1 quarter, then the difference is 1 quarter, which is rational, so you just put them back in the same box. What you'll end up with is a partition of the irrational numbers into boxes containing some irrational parts plus some rational parts. And each box will contain a representative, like for example pi over 4, which we can add some rational number to and get all the other numbers in the box. If you put all these representatives into a set, then you've just built a Vidali set, and this has no size. Implicit function theorem. This theorem states that if a function of two variables, f of x and y, equals 0, then dy by d x equals minus the partial derivative of f with respect to x over the partial derivative of f with respect to y. For example, let's say we have a function x squared plus y squared equals 1. Now, to differentiate this, we could use implicit differentiation and rearrange to get minus x over y, but that's wrong and you're stupid for even thinking that. If you just rearrange the equation to make it equal to 0, now we have a function of two variables, x and y, equal to 0, so we can just use the implicit function theorem to get the derivative if minus x over y. Cauchy Riemann equations. This is to do with complex analysis and it helps us to find whether a function is holomorphic or not. If we have a complex function f of z equals u of x and y plus v of x and y lots of i, then if all the partial derivatives exist and are continuous and they satisfy the Cauchy Riemann equations, then f of z is holomorphic, which means it's infinitely differentiable. Dominated convergence theorem. If we have a sequence of functions which we'll call f sub n, which converge to f as n tends to infinity, then does that mean that the integral of f sub n will converge to the integral of f as n tends to infinity? The answer is actually no, unless if it satisfies the dominated convergence theorem, which states that if f sub n converges to f and the absolute value of f sub n of x is less than or equal to some function g of x for all values of x, and the integral of g of x is finite, then the integral of f sub n tends to the integral of f. Compactness. If the metric d acting on a set x forms a metric space, then a, which is a subset of x, is called sequentially compact if for each sequence x sub n where n is an actual number which is a subset of a one finds a convergent sequence subsequence x sub n sub k where k is a natural number where the limit x tilde lies in a this means that inside a set a we have infinitely many points given by a sequence x sub n but each point will converge to a single point 
still in A. Special functions are certain well-studied functions that appear frequently across many areas of maths, physics, and engineering. Often as solutions to important differential equations or integrals, so for example, you can have e to the x, ln x, sine x, cosine x, tan x, or the gamma function, and so on. Calculus of variations is a branch of maths that deals with finding a function that makes a certain quantity, like an integral, as big or as small as possible. For example, in normal calculus, to find a minimum or a maximum of f of x, you would just find where f prime of x equals to zero. But in the calculus of variations, you form the function y of x that minimizes or maximizes this integral, where l is the Lagrangian. The function y of x that makes j of y stationary must satisfy this equation. Hey, Nibbana theorem. A subset s, which is a subset of the reals to the power n, is compact if and only if it is a closed and bounded set. A set being bounded means that it fits inside some big ball in Euclidean space, and the set being closed means that it contains all the boundary points, and the set being compact means that every open cover of S has a finite subcover. So this means no matter how you try to cover S with open sets, you can do it with only finitely many. Essential singularities. In complex analysis, a singularity is a point where a complex function f of z is not differentiable as a complex function, but is differentiable everywhere else in some neighborhood of that point. There are three types of isolated singularities. Removable singularity, which is where the limit as z tends to z0 of f of z exists and is finite, and we can fill in the point to make f analytic at z0. Pole, where f mod of f of z tends to infinity as z tends to z0, so f, f behaves like 1 over z minus z0 to the n near z0, and essential singularity, which is neither removable nor a pole, so the behavior near z0 is wildly erratic. Residue theorem. Let f of z be a complex function that is holomorphic everywhere inside and on a simple closed contour C, except for a few isolated singularities inside C. If we want to evaluate a contour integral of f of z, then the singularities inside C make this integral difficult. The residue of f at a singularity denoted as res of f at z0 is the coefficient of z minus z0 to the minus 1 in the Lorentz series expansion of f about z0. So res of f z0 equals a sub minus 1 if f of z is holomorphic inside and on a closed contour C, except for isolated singularities inside C, then the integral of f of z is 2 pi i lots of the sum of the residues of f for z sub k for k is 1 to n. Sard's theorem. Suppose we have a smooth map from the reals to the m to the reals to the n. We want to know what kinds of points in the reals to the n can be hit by f. The critical values of f are the images of the critical points. So the remaining points in the image are regular values. Sard's theorem states that if the reals to the m to the reals to the m is a k differentiable map with k greater than the max of m minus n and 0, then the set of critical values of f has measure 0 in the reals to the n, or in simpler terms, almost every point in the target, in the sense of the Lebesgue measure, is a regular value. Zeta function universality. The Riemann zeta function, usually written as zeta of s, is defined for complex numbers s and encodes information about prime numbers. Roughly speaking, universality means that the zeta function is so rich and flexible that when you shift it vertically in the complex plane, its values can mimic almost any other analytic function. In other words, zeta of s can approximate a wide variety of functions if you look at it along vertical lines in a certain region. Elliptic functions. An elliptic function is a special kind of function that repeats its values in two directions in the complex plane. You can think of it as a complex function that behaves like a two-dimensional version of a sine or cosine wave. For example, the Weierstrauss elliptic function, which is written as Weierstrauss of z, Riemann surfaces. When you deal with complex functions, many are multi-valued, meaning that for some inputs, the function can take on more than one value. For example, let's say f of z is square root of z, then f of one equals one or minus one. We use Riemann surfaces to untangle these multivariable functions by constructing a new surface on which they become single valued and analytic. A Riemann surface is a one complex dimensional surface that is a two dimensional manifold that locally looks like small pieces of the complex plane. But globally, it can have more complicated structure like several sheets joined together. Each point has a neighborhood that can be mapped to an open set in the complex plane and transitions between those patches are analytic. Green's function. Suppose you have a linear differential operator called L and you want to solve an equation of the form L of u of x equals f of x. The Green's function written as g of x and s is defined as the solution to L of g of x and s 
equals delta x minus s, where delta x minus s is the Dirac delta function, which represents a unit impulse at the point s. So g of x and s tells us how the system responds at a point x when you put a unit impulse at a point s. Once you know the Green's function, the solution to your original equation can be written as an integral u of x equals the integral of g of x and s f of s ds. Harmonic analysis is the study of how complicated signals, shapes, or functions can be broken down into simpler waves usually sines and cosines. The most common is the Fourier analysis, which says that a function can be expressed as the sum or integral of the sine functions. Holomorphic dynamics. Holomorphic dynamics is the study of what happens when you repeatedly apply a holomorphic function to points in the complex plane. So you're studying the behavior of the sequence z sub n equals f to the n z of zero. We want to know, given a starting point z of zero, what happens to the sequence z sub n. Does it converge to some point? Does it go off to infinity? Or does it bounce around chaotically forever screaming at all the neighbors and all the other dogs that it sees like a chihuahua. For example, let's consider the family of functions f sub c of z which is equal to z squared plus c where c is a complex constant. For each fixed c, look at what happens when you iterate f sub c on starting points of z zero. The Mandelbrot set is the collection of all values of c for which the orbit of zero under f sub c doesn't escape to infinity. Bloch's theorem. A crystal is made of atoms arranged in a periodic lattice, meaning the potential energy V of X that electrons feel repeats regularly. V of X plus A equals V of X, where A is the lattice spacing, or more generally, a lattice vector in 3D. The question is, what do the wave functions of electrons look like in such a periodic potential? Bloch's theorem states that in a periodic potential, the wave function of an electron can always be written as the product of a plane wave and a function with the same periodicity as the lattice. So the full wave function is this. Boundary functions. In mathematics, a boundary function refers to a function that is defined on the boundary of some domain, and it's used to determine or constrain functions inside the domain. Before Ted Kaczynski, well, you know, let's not talk about that. His papers included work on boundary functions of conformal mappings, which are ways of mapping one region of the complex plane to another while preserving angles and studying how the function behaves at edges of the domain or the boundary. Non-Archimedean analysis. For any two positive real numbers x and y, there exists a natural number n such that n times x is greater than y. This means that no matter how small x is, if you add it to itself enough times, you can exceed any given y. This is true for positive real numbers, but a non-Archimedean field is one that does not satisfy this property. For example, you can have a number system that extends the real numbers by including infinitesimals and infinitely large numbers. Delay refers to the dependence on past values of a function. For example, in a delay differential equation, dx of t over dt equals f of xt, comma xt minus tau, where t is the current time and tau is the delay. In control theory, a system with delay is called time delay system or a dead time system. For example, the transfer function g of s equals e to the power minus minus s tau ds over n of s, where e to the minus s tau represents a pure time delay in the Laplace domain. Baby slash papa slash grandpa Rudin. In 1938, when the Nazis annexed Austria, Walter Rudin, a 17-year-old Jewish boy, fled the country alone. His family was scattered. His father escaped later, but his mother and other relatives didn't survive past World War II. Rudin spent a few years moving across Europe, surviving under difficult circumstances. Alone with no money and no guarantee of safety, Rudin made his way to France and then England in 1939. When World War II ended, Rudin again emigrated to Canada, which was one of the few countries welcoming Jewish refugees and war veterans. Entered the University of Toronto as an undergraduate in mathematics. Blasting through his course, Broski finished his BA and MA in record time, then moved to the United States to pursue a PhD at MIT. At the time, there weren't many rigorous modern mathematics textbooks for real analysis at an undergraduate level. So he set about making a book that stripped away all the unnecessary fluff and left only the essential details, presented in an elegant way. In 1953, he published Principles of Mathematical Analysis, also known as Baby Rudin. Even though this is a university level mathematics textbook, because math beyond high school sort of just resets itself and turns into a completely different monster altogether, this is actually still the baby version, and the undergraduate students still read Baby Rudin to this day. In 1966, Giga Chad Walter Rudin wanted to go even further. He wasn't happy just teaching basic real analysis. How pathetic and simple. He wrote another book 
book for graduate students called Real and Complex Analysis, also known as Papa Rudin. And of course, even still, this book was too smooth-brained for Sigma male Walter Rudin. So again, in 1973, he published a book Functional Analysis, also known as Grandpa Rudin, designed for, I guess, Albert Einstein on steroids or something. I don't even know what, what you would even learn at that point. Das Fractional Calculus, which is German for fractional calculus. You've heard of the derivative and the integral, but what about the half derivative? What about an integral that's performed pi number of times? Did you think about that one, huh? No, did you think about that, huh? Well, don't worry, because two really smart mathematicians called Joseph Louisville and Bernard Riemann already did it with heavy brain work and found that the alpha th integral is this, where gamma of alpha is the gamma function and the alpha th derivative is just this. Believe it or not, we're still only one third of the way through this entire iceberg. And if you want to see part five, then get this video to 500 likes now. Now piss off.